So as you know, uh, this second part is a graduate student roundtable on the same topic and the same theme with um, um, three very uh, interesting papers. Um, so the first one is by Kate Elizabeth Crazy and Miriam Paninski. Kate is from history here at Brown and Miriam is from German studies here at Brown. So um, Kate is a graduate student in the Department of History and before coming to Brown, she pursued uh, graduate studies at Bilgi University in Istanbul and the University of California, Los Angeles. Her dissertation examines how the 1980s military coup in Turkey reorganized everyday life and paved the way for ne the neoliberal transformation of the country. Miriam is a doctoral student in the Department of German Studies. She studied comparative literature, German studies, aesthetics, and the philosophy of culture at the University of Vienna. Her research interests include the manifestation of trauma and loss of speech, the gaps of language, translation and translability, um, often within 20th century poetry. She also works in contemporary arts, curating and co-curating art shows, conferences and workshops in Vienna, Beirut, Istanbul, Tbilisi, and Zagreb. Her PhD projects revolves around rhetoric and interferences of violence, as well as staging, pathologizing, and conceptualizing of the body during pregnancy and childbirth. So um, her, um, their paper today, their shared paper today is called Care of Wounded Things uh, as a Form of World Care, a critical reading of Paula Jakub's work. So Kate and Miriam. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Uh, thank you all for being here. Before we start, we'd like to thank Vazira and Yanis and Ariella for convening this conference and including us. Uh, we'd also like to thank the wonderful staff at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, uh, Surya and Barbara in particular, for the logistical work that they've done to make today's gathering possible. Uh, so. Before we begin, I, clearly this is a, a co-presented paper, and I think part of what we're bringing into the conversation is sort of the question about collaboration, and collaboration as a way of thinking through some of these uh, very important and difficult questions, and sort of pushing and thinking about ways in which we can be exploring um, these questions in different kinds of ways that that sort of challenge some of the existing structures of knowledge production within the university. So while our paper won't take any of that on explicitly in its content, it's certainly part of what Miriam and I have been thinking and talking about in the process of working together. So through a discussion of the work of the Lebanese-born artist Paula Yacoub, our paper explores what it means to care for wounded objects and what's at stake in being attentive to violence inflicted upon objects in the aftermath of violent conflict. It asks how attending to the wounds, quote unquote, of buildings can be part of processes of repair in the wake of violent destruction. In addressing these questions, this paper attempts to bridge two sets of entangled inquiries that Miriam and I began to pursue together in the context of two COVID collaborative humanities seminars we both took in the fall of 2018 and the spring of 2019 here at Brown. In this short presentation today, we'll do three things. First, we will begin by providing some brief historical context of the Lebanese Civil War and its aftermath in Beirut in order to situate our reading of Yacoub's work. Second, we will offer a reading of Yacoub's work. And finally, we'll conclude by outlining three questions our reading of Yacoub's work raises for further discussion. So part one, historical context for understanding Beirut after the Civil War. Beirut was divided by a barricade, an invisible line, the Green Line, during the Lebanese Civil War, which officially lasted 15 years from 1975 to 1990. Across this demarcation called the Green Line, which cut off West Beirut from East Beirut, fighters from warring sides fired snipers at each other. So we have a few images just to sort of um, set this context up. Here is a map. There's all sorts of things we could say about maps and imperial knowledge production. Um, but here, I mean, this is to illustrate sort of the, the basic cartography of Beirut, uh, the land in relationship to the ocean, and also the, give you some sense of the sort of scale of the city and the divide between East and West Beirut. 
And here, the next two photographs are a couple of photographs of this area called the Green Line, which during the course of the war became virtually uninhabited. And the name the Green Line comes from the way in which uh, vegetation and nature took the space back over um, during the course of the war so that it by the, the war's end, there was actually this very sort of thick patch of vegetation that ran through the urban fabric of the city. Uh, those are Miriam's pictures for a minute. Arguably, the underlying causes of the war were multifaceted and political, not religious in nature necessarily, involving a complex set of actors who represented various regional and international interests. As the Lebanese scholar and sociologist Samir Khalif has noted, Lebanon played the role of a laboratory for proxy wars waged by Iranian-backed Hezbollah, Israel, Palestine, Syria, and their respective international allies. While the 1991 Amnesty for War Crimes, which pardoned all crimes prior to its enactment, may have been on the one hand, as he notes, a soothing factor for future good internal relations, as the entanglement of liabilities may have been too complex to solve otherwise, it also allowed sources of violence and tension to dwell in a void as something unperceptible. Moreover, it denied many victims of violence the ability to claim restitution or even have the violence they had experienced acknowledged by other parties in the conflict. Signs of destruction continued to be clearly present in both the emotional and physical landscape of the country, perhaps most notably in the urban fabric of Beirut. As the architect Michael Stanton has observed, at the formal conclusion of the war in 1990, Lebanon's infrastructure was, quote unquote, in shreds from collapsed highway overpasses, eroded communication and energy grids, destroyed water facilities and schools, and as many as 86,000 shattered homes. Two thirds of Lebanon's industries were damaged and many households and businesses were impaired by the lack of materials, power, and fuel. What can be seen in contemporary Beirut is a clash of destruction and the debris of war, as well as the erasure of this past with ultra-modern reconstruction projects. As Halif notes, architecture has arguably become a form of cultural ratification, bearing witness to the collision of remembrance or preservation of cult cultural heritage versus progression, restitution, and also annihilation. The Lebanese state had a large interest in quickly redeveloping the devastated city and largely disregarded efforts to encourage, recognize, and record the architectural archive of past violence from the Civil War. Khalif speaks of quote unquote collective amnesia, which is closely tied to homogenizing operations of the nation state. Symptomatic of such proceedings was the semi-privatization of city planning shortly after the war. Downtown Beirut was basically appropriated by Solidar, a private development company founded by then Prime Minister Rafi Kariri in 1994. Invoking a public um, private eminent domain, the joint stock company replaced, quote unquote, the property of 25, of 2050, 20, 250,000, sorry, numbers were never my strong suit, owners um, of property with Solidaire stock. So in effect, what happened was their property was confiscated from them, and as uh, compensation for the confiscation of their property, they were given shares in the joint stock company instead. Within a few years after the war, more than a thousand buildings were demolished, many with explosives, even though some of them had, in, had suffered relatively little damage by the Civil War. It's been argued that the Lebanese state has actively erased reminders of the war and sought to create a downtown space that emphasized the good aspects, cosmopolitan, international, and European of pre-war Beirut, and good aspects there is, that's in quotations, just to be clear. To proceed to um, the reading of Jakub's work. So the objects or the things we stumbled upon to speak with Arendt um, or that spoke to us and made us think and speak to each other about the intersection of art, architecture, archaeology, um, as well as their restitutions are art pieces or a set of art pieces by the Lebanese and currently Berlin-based artist Paola Jakub. These wafer-like discs are casts of bullet holes made out of wood paste taken from a wall 
in, um, that once ran along the Green Line. So Jakub herself is an artist, but also studied architecture and later worked as an archaeologist in downtown Beirut, where she was in charge of excavation drawings during the early re reconstruction of the city. While she may be more known for her photographic work to some of you, um, self-described as synoptic pictures and or ele elegiac uh, landscapes, which pair unspectacular panoramic shots of Beirut and South Lebanon with texts of varying length, from varying from small brisk captions to expansive essays. Um, we are we today discuss uh, these casts from 1995. So um, the casts indicate some sort of a vacancy as they remodel pieces of buildings that once were, were and throughout the process of casting, they simulate um, a closing of the bullet holes and the stage of the building or wall before the war. The pieces thus mirror the state of Beirut's architectural landscape subsisting between war remnant or memory preservation and upscale constructions or obscuring the past. Jakub's work engages with these concentration of disparate tractions, which for Jakub, as an inherent aspect of architectural in general, one on the one hand is the power and durability of architecture. Um, so in an interview, she, for example, she specifically mentions um, the Battle of the Hotels in Beirut, uh, a battle fought for the possession of the hotels as they were the tallest buildings. Uh, for heavy exchanges of rocket and artillery fires. Um, and on the other hand, the instability of architecture um, in the collision with an event, in this case, the Civil War, as architecture, quote unquote, quote, um, circulates through events, as she says, or as, again, Jakub, take, uh, war takes architecture and makes it move uh, during as well as after an event. Despite their engagement with architecture, the pieces display an absence that, according to the artist, cannot be matched with descriptive language and are inevitably linked to the place of their creation. Um, as her curator, Delecour, wrote, the act of destruction that took place long before the taking of the castes indicates a suffering of the urban fabric, implying a suffering of the social fabric, too, that cannot be shown at the moment of impact. Hence, Jakub seeks symptoms or traces of this suffering. Um, quote, end. Yet, as detached pieces in an exhibition far away from the war zone, they also display something entirely other. Um, at, as at first glance and without knowledge of their context, they represent nothing but abstract cultural, uh, scu sculptural works, uh, alienated forms or peculiar stones. Um, only the remembrance and the activity of Homo Faba, as Arendt states transform them into a worldly object. Um, as the artist mentions, she's aware of the problematic nature of aesthetizing these objects as a fetishism, uh, as, as a fetishism would deflect from an actual engagement. The questionable issue of the aestheticization of these objects would be both the centralized um, position of the artist as well as an excessive focus on the aesthetic value. Um, facilitating the violence of the war as too easily approachable and consumable through the lens of an art of art to the extent of being pleasurable and suggesting closure rather than an opening of reflection and affecting discomfort. Jakub proposes an inversion of this concept. Rather than displaying the historical event through art, she insists on an art practice which is entirely informed by the war. From the artisanal and historicist methods the artist feels obliged to, um, as well as to the material and the final forms of the pieces. She would thus like to understand her practice as more as a ritualizing, ritualizing she says, process rather than fetishizing and aestheticizing. The pieces generate a proximity to, to the kind of memorials which call attention to the, signif the significance of repetition, antagonizing closure, and revocation of violence. So by way of conclusion, there are three questions for further discussion that we'd like to outline here that um, come from our conversations together. and sort of thinking along with or thinking with Jakub's work. So the first, uh, the first question is, 
Arguably, acknowledgement is an important initial step in processes of restorative justice, as some of the earlier panelists talked about. Restitution and reparation are difficult without first acknowledging the damage that has been done and needs to be repaired. What does Yacoub's work and artistic process offer us in terms of thinking about how violence against objects can begin to be acknowledged and made visible, particularly within institutional spaces, museums, galleries, universities, um, and sort of offer us ways of, of thinking about the, the role that institutions have played in that violence, um, as Azule and MTL Collective and others have noted. In, what, in whitewashing the violence, both physical um, and epistemic of destructive imperial regimes. So thinking about the very, you know, marking the violence within these kinds of institutions and, and thinking about, you know, the ways in which they've actually been very um, complicit in terms of uh, projects of imperial destruction. So um, to a second set of questions, um, in her book, In the Wake, Christina Sharp makes a very strong distinction between memorials and their disposition in uh, what kind of, in what, as in what kind of effect they aim to generate. So um, in the context of commemoration of the violence of the slave trade, Sharp acutely criticizes memorials suggesting closure and undoing or transcending this experience, producing a sort of theatricality, activating the familiar, quote unquote, the familiar language of monuments and memorials, the language of injustice, suffering, tra tragedy, inspiration, and transcendence, quote end. The violence is archived as something past, which is to be preserved but never reanimated, and all victims relegated to this past are objectified. Sharp opposes such creations with examples of monuments which are grounded, again, quote, in the knowledge of the wake in a past that is not past, in a past that is still with us, in a past that cannot and should not be pacified in its presentation, quote, end. Um, in what ways, we thus ask, does Jakub's work invert this kind of memory work and offer a different modality for reckoning and living with the ongoingness of violent events? And the third question, um, we come to back to the, to the theme of this conference. Um, how might these pieces, the cast by Jakub, complicate our understanding of how violence and destructions have been gendered? So given that historically warfare has been gendered male in most societies, so was reconstruction gendered as something feminine or female. For instance, in Germany after the war, World War II, um, in 1945, the notion of the Trümmerfrauen, the debris, debris women or the ruin women, uh, was used for the women who rebuilt buildings uh, and cities in Berlin and elsewhere. Um, and even though we know, of course, that these uh, people were not women necessarily, there's still that heritage or that lineage of the idea of the war of being something heroic and male and the reconstruction of being kind of the dirty work, um, the dirty female work. Um, so, um, in this framework, the casts offer an interesting complication since they are neither reconstructing nor destructing. Um, so within the process of production, they complete or repair, they neither complete or repair, they re complete or repair the shot walls only then to be taken again and displayed in a museal context. So these pieces, however, seem to refuse to be metaphors of something, specifically the violence of war. Rather than speaking for, in the name of something, they seem to insist on being part of this reality of violence, as they are themselves neither restorative nor violating, but yet concurrently both um, they both confirm and refuse gender normative role distribution. And in this sense, uh, can we say that sub they subvert gender normativity to speak or to end with Judith Butler? Thank you. Thank you, Miriam and Kate. Our second speaker is Chris of you. Um, Chris is a doctoral student in sociology and social policy at Harvard University. Her research includes the social legacies of imperialism, ethnic and religious conflict, and the role of collective memory in peace building efforts. Um, her dissertation examines the imperial origins of global inequality through the lens of cultural materiality. 
drawing on artifact restitution debates between Nigeria and the UK. Her projects interrogates how neocolonial power relations materialize the struggles over cultural patrimony. A native of Nashville, Tennessee, um, she holds a BA in Anthropology and Religion uh, from Bates College and an MSc in Migration Studies from the University of Oxford. Chris. All right, thank you so much for having me and a um, particular thanks to the organizers um, and the staff as well for um, making this such a um, pleasant visit. Um, so the title of my talk is um, The Missing Women of Egun Street, Legacies of Gendered Bronze Casting and the Benin Kingdom, currently Nigeria. Um, so this paper is an extension of um, my larger dissertation project, which examines post-colonial relations between Nigeria um, and the UK by looking at the negotiations of Nigeria's material heritage that's currently held um, in the UK, particularly in the British Museum. Um, so roughly two weeks ago, um, I returned from a month-long visit to Nigeria where I spent time in Lagos and museums and speaking with young artists and in Benin City where the famous Benin bronzes were and continue to be produced. During my stay, I found, primarily, I found myself primarily talking to indiv individuals who identify and or present as men, as bronze casters, artists, curators, archivists, and other creative actors. This talk is a response to the conversations that I had with these men and my understanding of their role in the production of Benin's history. In this conversation, I ask, in restitution efforts, what do we miss when we chase objects only produced by men? How do you represent women who are present but have been erased in the process of producing artwork? This is an invitation to think critically about the gendered production of art, high art that valorizes men, the, accompl the accomplishment, sorry, of those identifying as men, and the gendered narrative of restitution that seeks such, such objects. I present this talk in a series of nine vignettes. Number one, the archive. The Benin bronzes are an archive, a collection of objects made not of bronze, but of brass, ivory, and wood. They tell the history of a people now living within the political boundaries of Nigeria. They are a record of Benin's royal history, of ancient lore of kings, leopards, cockerels, of important visits and visitors to the palace, and key events in the history of the monarchy. These objects have been produced since the 16th century in the same casting tradition in Benin City, the former capital of the Benin Kingdom, that was torched and looted in 1897 by British troops. Since the 16th century, they've been produced in the same place on the same road. The road is Egun Street, and for centuries, the famed Benin bronzes have all been produced here by men. Tradition holds that only men are permitted to produce these works, as bronze casting is a patrilineal craft. When I visited Egun Street last month, I asked, what happens to a bronze casting family's creative lineage if they do not have any sons? The tradition then dies, I'm told. The restitution of the Benin bronzes has been one of the most notorious cases of imperial restitution in history. But what does it mean to pursue the return of an archive produced solely by men in conversation with other men? Number two, context. <clears throat> in restitution, context is an evocative term. Context is consistently interrogated to justify and defend retention and return. Does the removal of objects strip them of their rightful context, or does their placement alongside other objects of similar age, material, and function provide greater universal context? Is contextualization a form of decolonization? See hashtag to, de to, to decolonize is to contextualize. But does the context in which the objects were produced matter? Do the stories that are told through the objects matter? Is our job as advocates for restitution to restore a balanced narrative to the stories these objects tell? Should restitution debates consider the stories that are told through the objects? And do we have a responsibility to pursue restitution in a way that balances the stories told by the objects? Would that even be moral? Can demands for restitution exist independent of the context in which the objects were created? Independent of the politics of the space and environment in which they were produced? 
When we say that we want to distor, restore Benin's history, what we really mean is that we want to restore a history of Benin told only by men. Number three, the tree the leopard mounts, no other animals dare climb. The Benin Kingdom has for centuries and continues to be a polygamous society. The Uba, or the king, has anywhere from a dozen to hundreds of wives that he maintains within a harem, secluded from non-court society. Prior to the 12th century, women in Benin society held high political office. But toward the end of the century, when the Uba structure was instituted, women were excluded from public life and their roles in the royal court were limited to sex roles as wives and mothers. Since the 15th century, the Uba has maintained a harem of secluded royal wives. During the British invasion in 1897, the harem's wing of the palace was targeted. The building was badly damaged, looted, and the queens were all kidnapped. Decades later, when the colonial administrators allowed the role of the Uba to resume, the harem was one of the first institutions reinstated. The British, though, forbid the naming of the Uba's mother as queen mother, and she was banished outside of the palace. The Oba's wives have historically been governed by a number of taboos. They were not allowed any bodily contact with anyone but the Oba. They were forbidden to eat deer or python meat. They are invisible and unknown to the outside world, their birth names being replaced by one conferred by the Oba. A queen who has children is no longer known by her own name, but by that of her children. The harem was also a space of discipline and punishment for girls believed to be disobedient. It was the responsibility of the queens to discipline the girl through isolation, physical labor, starvation, and other means until she was ready to be returned to society, reformed. Number four, the powerful woman. Women who hold power in Benin society have historically been seen as a threat to the monarchy. Princess Adelayo, due to the significant wealth and power she amassed in the 15th century, had been considered for the Oba's role, but she was denied due to her, quote, feminine indisposition. Subsequently, it was decided that no other woman would be allowed to reign over the Benin kingdom ever again. Queen Idia, also known as Yoba, or mother of the Oba, was the mother of Oba Asigi, who reigned from 1504 to 1550. It is her face that is depicted on what is perhaps the most famous of all the Benin artifacts looted from the palace in 1897. She was the first and only woman who ever entered into war for the kingdom and is credited in securing their victory in a number of battles and was therefore given the title of Queen Mother. This is her. Due to her efforts in battle, she was also allowed to live while her son reigned. Queen Idia was also believed to be one of the most beautiful queens to have reigned the kingdom due to the distinctive facial scarring marks on her face that she received when she was chosen for marriage by Oba Ozulua. Scars that were the key symbolic markers of socialization and feminization for women in Benin society. In ancient Benin tradition, the mothers of future Obas would have to either be killed or banished in order for their sons, for their sons to become Obas because it was believed that mothers were the only individuals who had power over men and no one was allowed to have power over the Oba. Thus death, or excommunication was necessary in securing the primacy of the Oba's power and reign. Number five, service. The success of men in Benin society was historically measured by the number of wives he took. The success of women was measured by the number of children she raised to maturity. Her success was rooted in her ability to produce, to please, to be consumed. Rarely was she the consumer of pleasure or status. Number six, the female artist. There exists a tension between women's, women's position as subject, but never agent in Benin's ancient, high, ancient art. In Nigeria, as across much of Africa, traditional art is largely distinguished between, quote, low crafts and, quote, high art. The former often produced by women and the latter men. The high arts are those typically used for ceremonial and ritual purposes, whereas the craft arts are primarily for domestic use. Art is spirit regarding of the male domain, and craft is person regarding of the female. As Marla Burns argues in her article, Art, History, and Gender, Women in Clay in West Africa, quote, the definition of women's craft production as, quote, low art form, even implicitly, can be seen as a tool to sustain arguments about the universal powerlessness of women. 
The negative way women artists have been presented in their relative dismissal is functional in the per perpetuation of the myth of masculine creative superiority and social dominance, end quote. Such objects are critical in the production of social and cultural meaning. What does it mean that Benin women were altogether excluded from the creation of works of ceremonial and ritual value that reveal the social and cultural history of the society? Excluded from the cultural construction of symbolic meanings and the social construction of gender. Excluded as producers of cultural texts, material negotiations, social meaning, and ritual practice. As transmitters of symbolic values and repertoire. How are concepts of gender materially and symbolically represented by the men who produce the objects? What stories are omitted through the prevailing androcentric view, representation, and gaze? What stories are fabricated? What are the male-centered assumptions that are held in the Benin bronzes? Do we privilege the male artists who produce them in our focus on restitution that doesn't interrogate the hands that produce them and those that weren't able to produce them? If it is only men that produce high art, and high art is the only art worth pursuing for restitution, what does this say about our commitment to the female artist? Number seven, the female subject. We hold this reality of gendered artistic production in tension with the frequent representation of women as subjects in Benin art. How do we think about representation when there is no authorship? One could think of the women represented in ancient Benin art, women like Queen Idia, as perhaps entering into dialogue with the men who produce the objects, thereby allowing those women to become agents in this narrative. What can, what can we learn about the strategies of dominance and control between the sexes in ancient Benin society through the depiction of women and their engagement in craft work? On Igun Street, where the legacy of Benin's bronzes, both old and new, ancient and contemporary, loom supreme, where are the voices of women? Where are the hands of women? It is not their hands which produce the sacred objects, Benin objects at the heart of the global restitution debates. But it is not just their hands that are absent. It is their memory and depiction of Benin's history. It is their ownership of the kingdom's narrative. It is their reflexive understanding of their own production of the past. It is seeing themselves portrayed in ways that they themselves have authorized. Would the nature of restitution debates change if we incorporated a discussion of the gendered production of the artifacts in question? If we reflected on the depictions of women and the objects in their androcentric gaze, on the social context in which women in the society live that might have influenced the way in which they're represented in the antiquities? What do we do with the scarification of Queen Idia's face, a story of subjecthood and violence historically only told by men? As the British Museum and the Met and other institutions where the identical pendant masks are held, wrestle with the questions of ownership, possession, loan, duplication, and return, there's a system systematic glossing over of the narrative of her location and significance within the Benin Kingdom and how that narrative came to be determined. Is it our responsibility to wrestle with her legacy in these debates? Perhaps the answer is no. Perhaps the demands for restitution should be unconditional and be made regardless of the gender identities of the artists, the portrayal of women in the art, and the social conditions that produce such work. Perhaps such questions impertinently and unfairly impose a set of Western feminist assumptions and expectations of gender norms that are inconsistent with the local or historical context. What assumptions about gender inequality and hierarchies might I be importing and imposing by asking these questions and considering these contexts? Number eight, administration. During my time in the archives of the National Museum of Lagos, I came across a mention of a Mrs. E.O. Murray. In 1944, 16 years before Nigeria's independence, Mrs. Murray, an administrator of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, was sent from London to Lagos as a skilled librarian and archivist to help, with the to help the museum organize, catalog, and preserve its archival documents. In a letter to the curator of the Lagos Museum, a London officer remarks about Mrs. Murray, quote, sir, it is important that I bring to your attention that this is a lady officer. The mention of her gender conveys, conveys the novelty of women in such spaces, not just in artistic production, but also within the colonial administration. That these objects were looted by men during the 1897 invasion, that most objects plundered during war or destroyed or carried away by men, as was noted in the previous talk, is important as we think through the gendered nature of theft and how theft shows up in the process of return. Number nine, a plea for context. 
My goal here is to not assess the gender relations of the ancient Benin kingdom, but to argue that context matters. The gendered meanings embodied in the representation and production of Benin art matters, especially as an increasing amount of global resources are being devoted to their conservation and ultimate return. Context matters for understanding the symbolic representation of Benin women and the objects. Context matters if we're going to be fully honest about the history of Benin and its social negotiations that facilitated the endurance of a male-only bronze guild and relegation of women's craft work to the domestic sphere. Context matters in understanding how men and women in Benin negotiate the power of their own aesthetic representation. Context matters if we were to pursue a commitment to rebalancing, this, rebalancing the scales of power both between nations and within them. As Ian Hodder argued in Reading the Past, quote, material culture and its associated meanings are played out as part of social strategies, which in turn is reflected back into the society through its material culture, with gender being at the core of such strategies. As we continue this uphill battle of pursuing justice for communities that have experienced the dislocation of their histories, may we continue to ask the important questions. How did they arrive at their current locations? How are they removed from their site of origin? Was the transfer legal or mutual? Who deserves to hold them? Should we privilege a legal, moral, cultural, or other defense? But may we also add to these questions ones that focus on the objects themselves. First and foremost, who made these and who didn't make these? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So um, our last um, speaker for today is um, Radhika Moral, um, who is, um, has completed her, uh, she's a graduate student here at Brown at the Anthropology Department, but she completed her MA in Cultural Studies at Dartmouth College, during which her research focused on the Rodriguez crisis, broadly on my, uh, more broadly, and also on migrant bodies and affective lives caught in ethno-nationalist politics. Her research focuses on migration and its relationship with social and cultural dynamics of water and climate um, in the Brahmaputra Valley in Assam in India's Northeast. Central to this are issues of agricultural labor and identity politics um, in regional uh, formations tied to more contemporary debates on citizenship and even possible exclusion from the Indian state, which is very topical. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to the organizers um, for giving me this opportunity. This is also uh, me sharing my research publicly for the first time. Um, so I'm really nervous about it, but I'm also looking forward to um, thinking together about some of these issues. Um, and thank you, Saraya, for answering my multiple questions uh, in the course of the last two, three weeks. Um, so my presentation may somewhat seem uh, uh, of an, uh, a bit of an interlope, interloper to the theme of restitution, but it does connect, uh, I think, in several important ways um, uh, in terms of how struggles of migrant women uh, in a state with an aggressive citizenship policy can be read through tropes of trauma uh, and uh, structural amnesia. Um, so my so my research is actually, uh, what I'm beginning to do is look at um, the political ecology of this particular um, sandbank uh, in, in located in uh, northeast India. Uh, so I'm more interested in sort of looking at water as a socio-cultural um, aspect of everyday living uh, and also, uh, also think about these spaces as a sacred geography. Uh, for this migrant community. Um, but um, very recently when I was doing fieldwork and also at the aftermath of a major citizenship act that just got passed in India, um, um, I actually found um, what is happening on ground to women uh, and what are some of the responses that have come up uh, at, the, at the aftermath of uh, these um, legal state-led uh, exercises. So um, just to give you a little bit of a context into the geography and the location, um, so I, you cannot see it in the picture, but it's because uh, these are uh, highly, uh, uh, these are zones that are very volatile to, uh, prone to getting flooded. So this was actually taken in the month of uh, July and August, I think, which is basically the peak monsoon months in these, uh, in this part of India. Um, 
these are sandbanks which are essentially uh, shifting temporary formations uh, or braided they kind of it's basically a result of the river sort of braiding and they form these uh, big structures of sand uh, alluvial uh, alluvial soil so they're actually very fertile um, so the brahmaputra originates in tibet um, uh, it originates in tibet and flows through a stretch of roughly 3000 kilometer uh, of undulating hills and plains along these eastern Himalayan foothills uh, to the Bangladesh plains where it joins the Bay of Bengal. Um, typically, the river and the valley in this state, uh, state of Assam, um, it, f it forms the very backbone of this uh, state, which is also seen as a frontier space um, as life courses through the water and its riverbanks. Um, these spaces have been habituated for many decades um, by a community of migrant farmers and fishermen. Um, dating back to the period of British rule in India since uh, you can, one can see history of migration patterns from the 1860s unt until after the formation of Bangladesh in 1971 where thousands of, hundreds of thousands of migrants have made their way to Assam from Bangladesh and the Bengal region. Uh, and have settled in these sandbanks, which are also called chars, which is also the, one of the title of my, um, uh, sorry, I should have said this before. So they're actually called chars. Um, and um, uh, anyway, so, so the people who live here, these migrants who, who have actually been citizens for a long time, um, uh, they're replete with knowledge of River Rhine Islands. Uh, they are migrating communities, so they bring their own skill sets. Uh, which is that of fishing, farming, and they also do uh, a, a work of masonry. Um, so there has been a history of these migrations where the sluggish agrarian economy of Assam has benefited from this community. So there's con so there, you know, there's been a very sort of uh, undeniably important sort of role that they've played in the uh, in this uh, agrarian region of Northeast India. Um, and uh, like Samsul, one of my first interlocutors uh, who I reconnected with this time, uh, have made Assam their home even long after India and Bangladesh mutually consented to a legal cutoff date uh, to end unauthorized uh, migration, which is 1971, and that is the independence uh, the, after the Bangladesh Liberation War. Today, around 34% of Assam's population consists of migrants. Uh, and they've and basically observing an increase by over 10 million since 2001, um, um, and this alone is a fact that today has uh, triggered in Assam this big debate on the inflow of the figure of the illegal immigrant, uh, which has led to this major state and legal exercise, um, which basically determines the status of uh, present inhabitants. Um, so for older settlers in this region, for, so for those who came before 1971 uh, and whose ancestors have lived here, um, uh, they've acquired Indian citizenship. And uh, therefore, now that they're being tested and tried on account of being a suspect Bangladeshi, uh, has added uh, layers of ambiguities uh, rather than trying to fix um, identities and boundaries um, between citizens and foreigners. Um, so what is this? So I was not actually working on this, but it just so happened that I, I stumbled upon responses that were only about the state exercise, which goes by the name of the National Register of Citizens, or the NRC. Um, it's not an old uh, exercise. It was instated, instituted in 1951, uh, but has come up more recently as um, a, a somewhat like a census kind of an operation. But it's not a census because it's not a head count, but it's re really identifying citizenship based on um, several criteria that I'll discuss. Um, so the NRC is primarily a so the NRC is primarily a citizen counting drive that has been undertaken in uh, that started in this border state. Um, it was uh, the recently uh, last year uh, in August uh, on August 31st, the final list that the government called it was published where uh, approximately two million people were left out and most of them were Bengali speaking Muslims and Hindus. Um, so the purpose of this drive is essentially to detect illegal immigrants and um, uh, in these uh, residing in these borderlands. Uh, of course, this is not new. This is one of many projects. There, there's been a fence uh, that along this uh, border with Bangladesh that was set up in the 80s as part of a bipartisan political move to curb uh, uh, unchecked immigration. 
Um, what is interesting and yet disturbing about this exercise is that there are multiple actors involved in this mechanism, ranging from the border security uh, forces to local courts residing, uh, to local courts and uh, re residents and neighbors themselves. Um, so it's really so in this multiple actor network, uh, there are also uh, uh, there's the position, uh, uh, there's the place for rumors and gossip that are also very instrumental in uh, actively seeking out to single out who is this illegal immigrant. Um, the NRC also, like previous colonial mappings of Assam uh, and cartographic projects, uh, it can be understood as a, a specifically modern administrative process of enumerating and calibrating populations uh, and an attempt to making uh, uh, otherwise fluid boundaries very, very distinct. Um, uh, the issue with uh, the NRC is that a lot of these documents that are needed to prove citizenship, uh, it uh, you know it uh, these are things that are usually accessible by uh, a certain class. Um, so people uh, they need to have land, they need to have ownership, they need to have access to education and jobs. So it has been especially difficult for um, the migrant community, uh, or also known as the the Choruas, to produce uh, uh, these various uh, sort of documents. Um, so this is uh, the picture of an NRC Seva Kendra. This is basically a typical what a verification booth looks like. So I did field work in uh, three locations. Uh, these are border districts called Barpeta, Morigao, Haju. Um, and uh, for example, I found that people here were facing much greater diff hardships in confirming their status, as the process was not just determined by uh, the possession of these documents, uh, but they were also made much tougher by instituting these kendras, um, which were about maybe 300 to 400 kilometers away from their homes. And what really happened is that, um, uh, so, there, so there are a bunch of things happening here. So men who typically would go to the Kendras taking their documents if they have them, uh, they would be gone for days. So in these situations, women for that temporary period of time would become heads of households, uh, uh, which, you know, of course, they, in, they expressed how it increased their already burdened domestic duties. Uh, but one of my interlocutors, Afia Sultana, told me that these um, chores have actually helped her to focus less on the anxieties that have proliferated uh, after the NRC list was published, and that she's been, um, in, in fact, she's been more involved with working uh, in the fields, preparing the produce for harvest in the month that build up to the traditional festival of the region called Bihu, which is basically to celebrate the harvest. Um, so uh, this was something that was completely unexpected. Uh, I was expecting to her to sort of talk more about her trials and tribulations. But in fact, she really said that, um, it, there, that this has been a space and time for her when her husband has not been around, that she has been able to participate um, in uh, sort of generating a better relationship with her uh, with, with the soil and the water, which they hold very dearly to them. Um, so, uh, and the other problem is that um, the, a lot of women have been caught in the midst of these transactions and these roadblocks, which basically have symbolized how governmentality gets framed through patriarchy. Uh, my other interlocutor, Rokeya Ali, um, I've I've changed changed the names due to confidentiality, but these are this is just to give you an idea of how uh, the reality is on ground and what people are dealing with. So um, Rukaya Ali is a weaver and a single mother who's lived in one of these border towns, um, and uh, she had to make a journey to an NRC booth, which was. 400 kilometers from her house. So not just the journey, but the incredulity and the disbelief of the officers about her place of origin, uh, who demanded extra and more extra documents, left her feeling despondent about ways to prove her legitimate claims uh, of citizenship. Uh, so typically, under patriarchal dispensations, um, which are more often than not prevalent in these parts, women are not considered in the inheritance customs and laws. So uh, this takes me back to uh, so three of the more, most important documents that you need to prove uh, show uh, to prove your citizenship are tenancy and land papers. So they kind of um, they kind of look like this. Uh, they're tenancy and land records and citizenship certificates or birth certificates. So what really happens is that um, uh, women are not 
uh, because they live in these border towns and they belong to rural uh, minority groups, they have to forego their ancestral and uh, paternal um, uh, property. Uh, and they are only seen as migrant dependents in their father's home before marriage and after marriage in their husband's homes. So what is worse is that women uh, here are not within the literacy net. The literacy rates here are very low, as low as 6 to 7 percent. Um, uh, and so bereft of property and education, they are left to their own devices. And a lot of them have reported cases of, uh, in, you know, in the chars, in the village, they've reported of cases of suicide. Um, uh, and uh, because of failing to produce these documents, these property ownership uh, documents and birth certificates of their children. So in some cases, husbands, men's names have been, uh, have come up in the list, but not women and children. Um, Another uh, interesting observation here was how women uh, have negotiated uh, within, they negotiate relationships, conversations, uh, you know, volatile spaces. Uh, and these are also, uh, I wanted to note that these are highly volatile spaces because they are the border towns. So there's uh, ethnic violence, there's occasional riots, uh, and a lot of uh, strict sort of military uh, uh, check posts and um, surveillance. So women have to negotiate all of this within their families and outside for papers. So they would sell off their jewelry or family heirlooms to arrange for money to garner uh, necessary documents or to pay for lawyers, uh, among other things. Um, what is important uh, to note here is uh, how these struggles of transiting from their homes in remote corners to border districts, to the centers of the city, uh, in search of legitimacy, reveal the dislocations and disruptions of everyday life that have accompanied this process. Um, and these assemblages of material, in this case, um, paper as a bureaucratic pathway, um, uh, these assemblages of materials and networks, aside of the legal requirements, point to the defi deficits of citizenship and the apparatuses that are built around their claim. So not, it's not the person who, is, who also needs to be there, but like a whole bunch of uh, papers and other objects that they need to show. Um, and in some cases, because l these lower level functionaries uh, in the NRC Kendras are pre predominantly, they're ethnically, linguistically Assamese, which is the local, uh, the dominant, uh, uh, the, the local language. Um, a lot of them have shown, uh, and again, because this is only recorded on paper, there is no digital recording uh, of any records. So it's uh, a lot of animosity and uh, bias sort of behavior comes from uh, these officials who just sort of do not even look at their documents uh, when they see that you are characterist characteristically a Muslim migrant because of also the clothes they wear, which is that of a lungi, uh, the, uh, the blue sort of uh, the cloth that they drape, and like the beard and their um, uh, fez. So um, finally, something else that I found, which I was not actually looking for, uh, is um, how they have coped in these times, especially uh, men primarily, but also women, is uh, this genre called Mia poetry. Mia is a word in Urdu, which uh, means gentleman, but is pejoratively used in the context of Assam to denote the uh, immigrant Bangladeshi across the border. Um, so Mia poetry is written, uh, this is a translated version uh, of a very well-known Mia poet. Um, uh, it's written in the local dialects uh, from two districts in Bangladesh, Maiman Singh and Pabna, and it is meshed with Assamese, the local language in Assam. So Mia poetry is really um, talking about the cultural, the socio-cultural and the politically fragile status of this community. Uh, and they also, um, uh, they, they go by, they call themselves Bengali origin Assamese Muslims. That is what they call them because they speak the language. My interactions with them have been uh, both in Bengali and mostly Assamese, actually, because I'm also a native of Assam. Um, so uh, they really draw Mia poetry. And as you can see here, some of the tropes here, they, they talk about the soil, they talk about the water, they talk about their clothes. Um, and it's really, uh, they're drawing from experiences with not just the ecology, uh, the contingent ecology around them, but also, um, you know, talking about their angst and lamenting uh, what has happened to their community. So. Um, I think, and I think a lot of criticism has come their way uh, from women in the charts, typically, who have said that because women are lesser educated, they are not able to write. So what women have done is they sing, and men write what they sing, and then they publish it. Um, uh, there's, I mean, there's 
uh, one could we can think of that more critically but i also think because the reality is that there is literally no access to education so women find this as the only outlet to experience their uh, to to express their angst and their uh, uh, pain uh, but also they've said that uh, and i quote uh, one of them uh, uh, well, actually, a Mia poet told me that this is not really an identity movement. It is a protest against the word Mia being used. Uh, some of the apprehensions are that Mia poetry may turn into an identity movement and play their own identity politics and seek our own language. But people need to understand that we are Assamese first, and Assamese is our language. Um, so that the community, and uh, uh, as I conclude, um, that the community is strangled by several tensions of being outsiders of this bureaucratic apathy of economic and social uh, emotional trauma that is most palpable in the experience uh, in the ex in the expressions of oral and folk songs and poetry that script memory um, uh, I think this is really a way that uh, I think is phenomenal in the way that they've uh, attempted to cope with this existential uh, dilemma that they've uh, endured. And this is an ongoing process. Um, uh, India has passed its Citizenship Act, which basically says that anybody, bar all people of all religion barring Muslims, um, uh, uh, can get citizenship in India. So uh, this has stirred a lot of violence, uh, not just debates in the region. Um, and this really brings into question uh, uh, Mia lives because uh, my research is really looking at them as um, in their sacred geographies as uh, 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 people of the soil and not as outsiders. So, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, thank you all for the questions. I have a few, so maybe I'll just say one and then maybe we can come back a bit later. Um, Cressa, this one's uh, for you. So thank you very much for the presentation. I also want to say it helped me think through a lot of my own work and things that I'm thinking about. And also just wanted to state that I appreciate that you seem to be, or at least to me, taking the objects seriously and critically in a way that I think a lot of this conversation needs because it makes it about more than just resolving white guilt or sort of displaying white benevolence, which I think in many ways we only take them on a surface level as things to be sort of returned to take as opposed to being understood and engaged. So I appreciate that because I think it adds a layer to this conversation that gets us beyond places where we often get stuck. Um, so I guess the question that I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on are what do you think about curation as a way to engage this? Because I think of curation in many ways as sort of a limiting frame, but I could see that as something that some people would bring into this conversation. It's okay, one way to address this may be through curation. So in generally, what are your thoughts on that? Because one of the proposed solutions to restitution is to put them in museums, right? So do you see either museums been in Nigerian government, which is a whole other conversation, but the curation component, and secondly, how do you see diaspora playing into this? Uh, yeah, I'd be interested. So curation and diaspora, and how do those two connect in? I'll stop. Should I take the question now? Or uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Um, so those are both great questions. Thank you for raising them. Um, I think curation is a really interesting question because um, I think a lot of it depends on context and who's doing the curating. So one of the, so uh, the Cape Brunley in Paris, which has been um, under heavy scrutiny since the Sarah Savoy report came out, um, the director, Stefan Martin, is departing. This is his last year, and if he hasn't already, and one of the um, his statements, he's been very uh, publicly against restitution, um, particularly around objects um, that are held at the Cape Brunley. And one of the things that he said on his way out um, is, well, you know, instead of returning the objects, what we should do is bring more people from the continent or from the, you know, the various continents into the museum so that they can have roles in curating. Because, you know, the issue isn't for him. It's like, you know, I don't think the issue is restitution. I think the issue is representation um, and how they're, you know, how the objects are presented. And that goes back to who's doing the curation. And so, I mean, for me, that wasn't, that doesn't feel satisfactory. I mean, that feels important, um, but that doesn't, um, I don't think that that actually does the work of kind of then, uh, you know, kind of discounting restitution or reparations as, um, uh, yeah, like a viable conversation. But I think that um, 
the same conversations are happening in Nigeria. And that's why I think it was really important for me to go and have these conversations. So there is a, a new Royal Museum that's set to open in 2023, I believe, in Benin City. Um, and it's going to be inside of the palace. Um, and so the idea that, like, that's been one part of the conversation, which I think we haven't been thinking about, is, I mean, some people have, you know, said, well, you know, one of the defenses for um, retaining the objects in Western, you know, universal museums as well, we don't know where to send them back to, you know, the Benin Kingdom doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, the, and the Benin people are scattered, and which is true. Um, but you know, there's, there's no like viable return option, because like the place from which they were taken doesn't exist anymore, like the palace was destroyed. And so the response of um, the Benin government and the Nigerian government has been to say, well, we'll build a new museum inside of the palace. And that's been, I mean, it's, it's been pretty contentious, I think, on a lot of fronts, because um, some people would say, no, these objects need to go back to, this was referenced in one of the earlier talks, um, the objects weren't necessarily meant to be on display. They were removed from the palace. And so by returning them to the palace, but on display for the public, it really kind of complicates what their original, um, you know, the original kind of function was. And so I think that um, can even, you know, curation in the Nigerian context is very much contested. And so I think it, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I should just maybe leave it. Does that yeah. answer your question? And then the second question, I'll be more um, succinct about this. So diaspora shows up in a lot of really powerful ways. Um, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine um, who is um, who's Indian and he'd never he's actually never been to India before and uh, we were in London and he said you know I kind of resent the fact that you're doing this work um, because you know you know you all are just trying to take the artifacts you know back to um, you know the, the countries of origin but he's like I've never been to India I've never been you know to this place where I'm supposedly from and he's like the only way that I can encounter these objects is through their collections at these global museums. So he's like, the only way I can see these Indian objects is by going to the British Museum or by going. And so I think that's like one kind of dominant diasporic perspective is, well, for those, you know, the diaspora who've never been um, to the countries where their families are from, this is the only way that they can encounter them. And I think that's a really valid argument. Um, but you do see, so for instance, at the Victoria and Albert Museum, you see curators um, and, and gallery, um, you know, kind of like collectors and um, folks that are displaying these objects, really engaging with the diaspora and asking them, like, what do you think about the objects being here? And so one of the most provocative examples of that that I've seen is at the Victoria and Albert Museum. So the Magdala ex um, exhibition that's from, um, of the Ethiopian artifacts, um, really engages the diaspora um, and there's there's a sense that it's 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 there's a critique from within the diaspora, but the critique isn't isn't actually being used in a way that kind of levels the conversation. I think it's being used in a way that actually then absolves again like the Sun von Martin argument. It kind of absolves them of any responsibility of thinking further about restitution. It says, oh well, we've talked to the diaspora, so we've done enough. You know then they should be okay with, they they're not gonna to continue to ask for the objects if we've actually consulted with them, even if in those consultations it's revealed that the diaspora isn't comfortable with having the objects there. Sorry, I had a, a follow-up actually, I think we got through. <laughs> um, so, hi Chris, um, so I wanted to ask, I might just note as you were mentioning that suggestion from Stefan Martin about bringing curators from, from, from Africa to curate the objects in France that, the idea of them curating French objects never seems to, to come up. That would, to me, seem like a much more productive intervention. <laughs> Is this echoing a lot? I'm sorry. Um, but in any case, I, I wanted to ask you um, a couple things, just sort of my sense from your, your presentation. One was, um, do you con conceive of restitution in relationship to the gendered production of those bronzes as a kind of in binary opposition to a surfacing of the, the gendering of those objects themselves, i.e. that we do one kind of work or the other kind of work, or that both can happen simultaneously. Um, I'm, I'm curious also about the kind of geography of that sort of work, which is to say, is there a certain, is, is there already in, in your sort of research in Nigeria efforts underway to clarify the, and to sort of problematize that sort of low high distinction in the production of our objects and the gendering of those 
say, more hallowed and, and, and sought after objects whose restitution is being sought while simultaneously at the other side of things. In Britain, one might simply be having a, a sort of slightly more succinct claim about the fact that these things don't belong to you and they're the issue of colonial violence and you are not in a position to dictate their, their fundamental place of being. Does that, does that make sense? It does, yeah. So I'll answer the second question first. I would say that the way that it's, the, the issue of kind of high versus low art in Nigeria at least, I mean I can't speak for other parts of the continent, but I think it's really grappled with in this kind of like capitalist sense. So when I was on Igun Street, I uh, was specifically trying to look for female vendors to buy, you know, so I, I bought some, <laughs> some more contemporary pieces myself when I was there. Um, and so I was looking for female vendors, and so I asked this woman, she had these bronze objects, and this is before, um, you know, I knew about the kind of production um, of the objects, and I asked her, I said, oh, did you make these? Because these are kind of newer, and I imagine that what I'd been reading was, you know, kind of pre-colonial um, regulations around who could make the bronze work. I didn't realize that this was still the case today. Um, and so I was asking her, you know, did you make these? And she's like, oh no, my husband did. But she's like, but I, you know, she kind of had this sense of pride, like I'm the one who's selling them though. I'm the one who's like bringing them to the market. Like I'm the one. And so there's kind of like this like capitalist understanding of, well, it doesn't really make them. I'm the one that's selling them and presumably I'm getting, you know, my household is getting, like I'm bringing in, uh, you know, kind of material um, wealth from, you know, the sell of these products to my household. So like that, um, I didn't hear a lot of reflections on, uh, you know, kind of, yeah, any other like division of labor kind of within, aside from like, they're the producers and we are the kind of vendors or marketers. Um, but that wasn't really critiqued or antagonized, so I don't, I don't know or interrogated, so I'm not sure, um, yeah, how other folks would respond. But I, you know, I, I didn't actually talk to a lot of women, and that was, I mean, one of the things that um, I thought just really stuck with me. I talked to really two women in my field work, just, I mean, I was there for a month, but um, in kind of official museum capacities. Um, and they were senior level individuals, um, but when I would ask them about the gendered production um, of these artifacts, they would just kind of say, that's how it's always been, but like women are really running it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think this, the first question, I mean, I think that absolutely they can happen simultaneously, and I think that's what, and maybe I didn't articulate that well enough, but I think that there can be, I think that we can like absolutely you know, continue these calls for restitution while also like interrogating um, the kind of the sources and the hands and like, you know, the, the ways in which these objects were produced. I don't think that they um, are necessarily mutually exclusive. And I don't think that, and I, you know, even said that like, I think that this idea that like restitution should be made, like restitution demands or requests should be made unconditionally regardless of the context in which the art, I mean, I was, you know, it's being a bit tongue in cheek in that assertion, but I do think that um, you know the context matters in the sense that we should be asking these questions. But you know, it definitely shouldn't preclude us from continuing to pursue um, you know kind of restorative justice in the sense. But I think it's just a conversation that needs to be had as we are pursuing uh, restitution. Thank you. In the, in the interest of time. <laughs> Um, we're just thinking that in the interest of time, it would be good to get uh, to take a bunch of questions to everybody, and then we'll um, allow a few minutes towards the end for, for, for response and answers. So who would like to uh, Thank you. Uh, so I have two uh, more general questions, uh, and then a question to Chris, uh, or maybe also to Kate and Miriam. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, I think that... One of the things that uh, uh, really was, let's say, performed through your presentations is how important it is really to uh, uh, forget about restitution as a, uh, a disembodied category. Uh, so, uh, but also in relation to this, I think that what also came up across the th uh, three presentations is the production of absence and then kind of, let's say, even a trap of how we have to respond to a kind of deficiency or an absence, it came, you know, with the documents uh, mm -hmm. Radica in relation to what you did, in relation to Paula Yacoub, it is the uh, uh, holes in the uh, houses, but it's also the, uh, um, 
discarding the houses from being uh, habitable. And uh, uh, Chris, I think in your uh, 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 presentation, it's the way that what was uh, uh, looted was uh, art that was done by men. So hence, the absence is being produced on the negative. Uh, uh, because, no, maybe l let me frame it differently after I heard you. Uh, the art that was looted that became at the center of the conversation is the bronze uh, produced by men. But I'm not sure if digging uh, farther in different uh, museums that uh, were involved in the looting, you will not find art that was produced also by women that is not part of the bronze. Uh, and I trust those museums that they looted also this kind of art that you defined as low art uh, or craft. But now I would like to come to the specific question that I had for you. Uh, uh, do you know from when is this distinction uh, 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 in the context of Benin between low and uh, high, between craft and art? Because uh, uh, can't we think about different uh, guilds of different type of uh, object making or craft making, whatever, that through the uh, 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 invasion, and the invasion was not only with the so-called punitive uh, expedition, the uh, invasion was there even before. So through the British invasion, and not only the British invasion to Benin, uh, uh, this uh, uh, understanding or this reconfiguration of different uh, modalities of making art was subsumed into the dis a distinction which is between high and low. Uh, if you can uh, uh, say something about this. And then Kate and Miriam, I, have, uh, 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 I wanted to ask you something. It's not a critique of what you did. Mm -hmm. It's maybe a reflection in relation to Paula Yacoub and to the regime of museums. And speaking about regime of museums, I must say something in relation to uh, what Chris and Stanley said and what you said about bringing uh, curators from uh, uh, the places from where the objects were looted. The uh, Tour Museum, the museum that was created by Leopold uh, II, uh, 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 that is based on the genocide of millions of people, they invited two uh, Congolese curators and they opened the museum after, after seven years. And of course, the regime of the museum defeated any uh, curator. But this was just in parentheses. Coming back to uh, your, I couldn't not think about how inventive is the capitalist understanding of museums that uh, 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 there is always more to extract. Always more to extract and then to trade in this, in what is extracted. Uh, uh, if you can reflect on this, because I think that alongside the way that the regime of plunder and the regime of museum create absences, that create defic deficiencies that interpolate us to uh, 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 somehow address these deficiencies sometimes under the regime of museums. We cannot forget also the procedures or the structural uh, uh, way that extraction organizes uh, this. And when I'm speaking about extraction, I'm also thinking about there is something very interesting in our practice of uh, casting those holes in the buildings. But then there is nothing that is being returned to the community. Hence, I yes. call it extraction. Hence, mm -hmm. I call it also part of the primitive accumulation notion. Uh, so, yeah. um, more? More questions? Um, th thank you, everybody. Um, I really enjoyed all your presentations. One thing I enjoyed was that we kind of got different times of, you know, trauma, which is from Veronica is very much in the present to Chris is very much in the kind of a colonial past. So I was wondering, um, you know, how does that like distance from a traumatic event affect what the view of of restitution might look like? So, for example, like if the restitution of citizenship in case of Veronica's or restitution of these objects in case of in the case of Cressa. Um, so following up on that, uh, thinking about each of your papers, I was struck by a kind of archive formation from which you were, you were, you, each of you were kind of constructing an archive from which you were thinking with objects, be it the Benin sculptures or um, this made um, bullet 
structures, uh, pieces, or documents. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was a little, um, uh, uh, and I wanted to think about the way in which uh, we, we then go in and think with that, that archive. So, um, uh, Kresa, I was thinking of uh, working in very similar kinds of imperial archives where, where, where particularly these British imperial archives erase women systematically within that, that archive so that when you find this absence, I'm left a little uncertain about whether this absence of women is, uh, to, to what extent the absence of women in the social world um, is a pr production of the archive itself from which you're thinking. So from other regions that I work on, I know there are almost no women in, in, mm -hmm. in the narratives, uh, in the colonial gaz gazettes. Mm -hmm. And in a way, when they do enter, they enter in ways in which Victorian imagination is imposed upon social relations and reorganizes reorganizes our historical understanding. So, so th that archive that you're thinking with, to what extent that, in that moment of archive formation, the images that you showed us were all from the imperial archive. Um, to what extent that imperial archive is erasing <coughs> the women that that. Um, you're thinking with, which also made me think with Radhika, you're, you're working with your, 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 if, if your archive, well, if your archive is these documents, they're, they're, it's, it's generating um, a whole set of uh, categories that people must now try to to fit into. And so it becomes really complicated also on how you speak of them. At some points, I, I, I know you were, you were speaking of them as being of the land and mm -hmm. repairing mm -hmm. them to the land mm -hmm. or in relation to the land. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, it, you were using the, 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 document, the categories of the documents, Bangladeshi, mm -hmm. uh, Assamese, Bengali, Muslim, mm -hmm. and Mia in particular, mm -hmm. which is which is used in many other parts of South Asia, uh, mm -hmm. parts of India, mm -hmm. as a derogatory term mm -hmm. for Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, so to use a derogatory term, the way in which when he says he doesn't want it to be identity politics, it is really a, mm -hmm. a term of abuse, mm -hmm. uh, a term of abuse which then is being um, works through the poetry. Mm -hmm. So to think about what it means to speak of uh, or use that term, mm -hmm. uh, a, term a term of abuse uh, that, is, that is circulating. So uh, if, if, the, if, if, you're, if, if these documents are the archive that you are mm. working and thinking with, that, that is a matter of, that's, that's unsettling for me, to, that you don't reproduce the violence of the archive. And I and I thought the same for both you and Kate. Like in a way, um, there's a vibe, there, there's a moment when she said the the, the architecture uh, on the move, um, and um, to think about wounded buildings and wounded and 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 uh, create an archive with the wounds of the buildings um, in. Uh, where the habitation, um, there was one image that you showed of, of um, uh, um, um, plants, uh, was the, the street was full of uh, plants that had vegetation that had grown. Um, that seemed like a moment, that seemed like an image of in which habitation had reclaimed those spaces anew. Um, I, I didn't know if that image was, um, yeah, where, where, where you thought of that image vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Yakub's work, which seemed to be taking um, parts of a building, creating an archive, and in to what extent it's reproducing these archives of violence. 
think we have enough um, questions and comments for you, and you only have five minutes, all of you. So. <laughs> jump in. <laughs> um, I'll start, I have a lot of notes here, but I'll start by responding to quickly to sort of the two questions that Ariella posed and then I have a thought about what you just said, Vizira. Um, so in response to sort of this question, so because I think, I mean, how I'm thinking about the question you posed, Ariella, of how do we respond to sort of deficiency and absence. In some ways, I would link this also to the second question that you asked about the sort of primitive, the kind of primitive accumulation in museal spaces, because I think why I link these two is, for me, there's a real tension in terms of using art to think about some of these questions, because I think on the one hand, the sort of let's say creative products of, artic of artistic practice can be really generative to think along with and they can sort of make visible certain processes and absences that otherwise maybe are more difficult to have a sense of or articulate. But I think that there's, there's a tension for me there because those are also creating things that are new, right? Like, and I, I think that part of part of what I come back to in terms of thinking, um, Vizira, to use the words you, you gave us earlier, sort of thinking about ways of living together and modes of world repair. I, I mean, I think part of my answer to that question is like, well, we have to, refu we have to refuse the new. Like, we, we need to sort of, we need to not make new things. We must live in the absences as they, as they are and kind of do something with, with those. So, I think that's maybe not an answer to the question, but I think it's part of how um, it's part of how I'm thinking about that that question now, and simply to highlight that I think there's there's a, a tension, there's very much a, a tension there that I'm wrestling with in my own thinking that I think is very I think is a generative um, tension, but is nevertheless a, a tension. And very quickly, uh, Vazira to the sort of question or the the question that you raised about the photograph earlier of the 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 green line with the the habitation i mean i would point out that's non-human habitation and i so i think there's even a whole set of questions we're not even asking about world repair and non-human actors and what it means to sort of repair and share the world not only with sort of objects and things that are of our own making but also with with the environment and with animals and creatures that are kind of um, beyond the realm of of the human and so for me I think that's that's how I would maybe start to think some about about that picture and it's a very, on one hand, it's a very habitable picture, and yet again, there's a tension. There aren't any people there. It's kind of nature taking things back over. So I'll leave it with that. Yeah, I just want to. I just want to add um, quickly. Rather than really being able to answer, I would like to just affirm both uh, Vazira and your Ariella's question, whether this is some sort of a reproduction or a continuation of a certain violence, these pieces, and I say yes, and we didn't choose them because we think they make anything right or they, 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 they are a good example for some sort of a um, memorial in, in the sense of Chris, how Christina Sharps think, Sharp thinks of, of them, but rather because um, they want to be Certain, they, they, they sort of want to be a voice for this community that you ask, Ariella, how, how do they give anything back? How, what, what is given back? I don't think there's anything given back, but they want to give something back as in, in their representation. And I certainly, I think both of us were, were very struck and uh, confused by the fact that, that these are displayed in the end in the, in the museal white cube context and what do we do with that we didn't come up with any answer but but that's why we kind of that's why we brought them here because i think that's just it's it, it they just complicated enough for enough for us to kind of raise a few more questions that seemed important for us i guess yeah um, I'll start with uh, answering Vazira's question i think it's a really important one and um, uh, and i think 
where I stand right now, my answer would be that the I think the word Mia in the context of Assam, at least, uh, and from my conversations with this community, it comes out of um, uh, th this sort of you know, you know when when they moved, and then for the for the ones who've been here for uh, many 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 years, I think for them it's really about. Uh, how they've integrated into what is Assam what is a social fabric of uh, the Assamese society. So they really don't, and I guess that's something that that's worth exploring. Is they don't, I I think Mia is this identity that they want to preserve, which is we are also Assamese, but we also speak Bengali, and I think that's where it's at least for them in their poetry that's where it's coming from, and Mia also being very significantly related to um, them as a river community, and in fact within Mia poetry they use dialects with, that exist in the region, uh, which is, for example something called Boithali, which is the songs that the fisher that the fisher folk sing, so. I, th I think that's my answer now in terms of thinking about how Mia is used. But of course, um, uh, there are pejorative and derogatory sort of context to how it has been used. And now, especially after the NRC and the CAA, um, how the word has come to proliferate in uh, everyday conversations, actually something which didn't happen before. Um, like earlier, uh, you know, you meet, you meet someone and they would say that, oh, you know, the Mia community lives by the char, but now it's like, Oh, the ones who are whose names are not on the list and who are doubtful. So they're in a D voters list. So I think the definition of Mia itself has changed in the last few years. Um, and does that answer your question a little bit? And I think also thinking about um, not to. I think a lot of my research is based on the archive, and I think one of the biggest challenges has been because of such low literacy uh, rates among women. Uh, they, they, I mean, they also don't know what documents they need to produce. If someone says, like, land papers, they know what the color of the land paper is, and that's what they look for. So even with the women, I think they're like, we don't know what to give. We just know that, you know, we are for off here, uh, that we know how to cultivate, we know how to fish, we know the songs. Um, so I think the uh, biggest problem, therefore, and, and I think that's also a criticism of the Mia poetry because it's been seen as a masculine movement because men are the ones who are writing it. Um, but yeah, these are. Um, uh, but I think uh, I think Mia in this sense is like tied up uh, with land simply because of their uh, intimacies with um, you know the fishing boat, the fishing net, the fish, and how these come to be iconic forces in their lives, um, uh, and then. Uh, uh, to answer Ben's question, oh, Ben's not here. Oh, I'm here. Okay. To answer your question, I think um, the restitution of citizenship. Yeah, I think it's an important question because, on the one hand, uh, they are a very important economic, uh, social, cultural force in this region, uh, and for decades they have been. Uh, and you know, for the longest time, they were not spoken of as doubtful. Uh, and now it's you know the conversations have become about uh, oh you know they're they're probably here after 1971 which is after uh, uh, formation of Bangladesh, so um, it's hard to say. I think it links up to uh, Ariola's question about uh, deficit, and I think the NRC mechanism functions in such a way that. Uh, it is to keep them in a state of, uh, you know, constantly hunting for more and more papers to sort of elongate and prolong the process of being in that space where I just need to have more papers and more papers and anything that I can produce to uh, that legitimizes my existence here. So I think it's also, uh, in some ways, uh, a systematic strategic move that has been taken up uh, by the local parties and the state government where they're saying that, oh, you know, no, don't worry, this is just one of the lists, there'll be more. So to keep them to, to to circulate that sort of deficit, and I think it's a process, and and uh, and people are actually uh, you know selling land and selling mm. cattle to buy to get more money, uh, to have access. Um, yeah, thank you. I I feel very self conscious about how much time I took in the beginning. So we, have a we do okay. All right. So quickly then. Um, I think, Ariella, to your point about the distinction between the high and low modalities, I think it's a really interesting one. I think particularly in the context of how um, some of the kind of defenses of retention um, or restitution are made around the actual material um, that the objects are produced with. So there's one argument, um, and I don't know how popular it is, but just in the literature you come across this argument that um, 
while maybe, um, you know, like there are certain kinds of work, depending on the material that they are made from, that are meant to be preserved, and there are other kinds of work that are meant to uh, essentially just kind of disappear. And so the latter um, is usually terracotta and like very kind of like earth based um, forms of work, which happen to be, or maybe not so incidentally, are the um, you know the the craft work or the you know the work that's produced by women that's for use in domestic spaces, and so I think there's this active resistance against like this idea of like kinds of materials being relegated to um, certain genders and how those materials are are meant to be cared for or, like looked after, um, in in terms of conservation or preservation, and so I do feel like I see because women are not allowed to make bronze works in Benin. I do see kind of an overrepresentation of, um, or kind of a, you know, a, an attempt to um, kind of overcompensate for the lack of women that are in bronze working and more contemporary kinds of um, artwork. So like more contemporary um, forms of art that you see in Benin. Um, so that's yeah, that's just. Um, and then the second response to, I think, um, is there your question about reproducing the violence of the archive, I think is absolutely right. Um, I think that, you know, I, I was doing a little bit of that in terms of being like slightly provocative and like the way in which I portrayed women, um, you know, in the kind of pre-colonial period. Like I, in a way I was almost like projecting these very, um, you know, kind of provocative images of women and, you know, a harem and women not being allowed to eat python meat because that's how they're represented in the colonial archive. And so what I was really trying to do is say that this is how they're being portrayed and these are the objects that we're being, that we're chasing or that we're, you know, we're attempting to, um, um, to retrieve. And these kind of sensationalized representations of women um, don't actually reflect their reality and you know I think it would do it, it takes a lot of work to recover what that reality is and so I think my attempt is to really kind of um, just act as like a provocateur in a way of like these images and say that like these are the ones that are being um, you know kind of presented but what about the absences and the kind of erasures that have happened and are we not trying to also then like reclaim those images and representations as well we are uh, running out of time. I have finished at um, half past six, but I think this is just an opportunity to say again thank you, first of all, to all our speakers for such an engaging and inspiring afternoon. Uh, this is an ongoing conversation, of course. This is um, only one event, and we're going to have several events around similar issues over the semester and the, 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 the years uh, to come. And um, as um, as Basile said at the beginning, our next event is going to be the opening of the exhibition on contemporary migration, which is going to happen at the Half Refer Museum on the 20th of this month of February at 5 o'clock. So you're all invited to um, come to the opening and also see the exhibition um, based on, on material uh, from the island of Lesbos um, as a kind of an opportunity to discuss contemporary uh, border crossing and migration in the broader context of, of the colonial kind of um, matters in the colonial uh, discussion. So we would like to thank uh, the Middle Eastern Studies Center for you know being the main host and the main supporter, but also all other departments and institutes and centers that contributed to this event. Um, of course, Bar to Barbara and Seraya for their logistic and practical help throughout. Um, and all of you, all our participants for being here and staying until almost 7 o'clock. Thank you.